the, the single greatest lesson I've learned is that I don't know everything. And it took some failures, some setbacks, some humbling experiences for me to really, and, and it's still a process, to throw dogma out the window and to really start taking the blinders off, learning from my daily experiences, learning from the people I meet, the people I, I, I speak to, you know, it took me a long time. It's interesting what Kurt says, actually, because we don't know everything. And in fact, everything we know, we have actually learned from somebody else. So why not make that a regular habit? Why not learn from other people who have made all of the mistakes that you are likely to be making anyway? So you might as well learn about people's stories that have gone into business on their own, that have made the mistakes, have learned from it. So there is an opportunity to shortcut it. Listen to Kurt's story because there's a lot more that you've got to learn. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Kurt. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Michael? I'm brilliant and so excited to speak to an American on the other side of the pond, as they call it. And I really appreciate you taking the time out. I really can't wait to hear your story. I've been watching some of your videos on LinkedIn and they're hugely inspirational and motivational. So thank you for doing those. And um, and yeah, let's get into it. And I'm, I'm going to start with the same question as I ask everybody that comes on this podcast. And that's, would you share a little bit about your personal life? So where were you born? Where did you move around? Give us a sense of, because I know America is a massive place. Um, <laughs> a little bit about your education, where you now live and, and where your home is. You can share about your family, hobbies, interests, just so people get a sense of who you are. And yeah, look forward sure. to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, first, thank you for having me on the podcast. Thanks for watching my LinkedIn videos. Pleasure. Um, so I, I was actually born in Manhattan in New York City. Uh, my family actually lived in New Jersey, but I was raised when people ask me where I'm from. I tell them Chicago, even though I was born in the suburbs in a town about, you know, half hour outside of Chicago. Yeah, uh, that's where I was raised since I was five, went uh, had my my schooling there. Um, and then I went and I had uh, four brothers, I'm sorry, three brothers and a sister, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, three brothers and a sister. And, um, so grew up there, went to the university of Iowa in Iowa city and did not like school, did not like college. I liked my friends. I liked the experiences of that while I was there, mm. but while I was in college, I just couldn't wait to get out. And ever since I was probably in eighth grade or even before I wanted to own my own business and so I was just very impatient. So I probably worked in college more than I went to class. Wow. Um, I worked for, uh, I had internships in Washington, D.C. and New York City uh, for some very large public relations firms. I worked for a professor at my university who ran a public opinion research firm. I worked for a U.S. senator uh, when I was, in, you know, in Iowa. And so when I got out, you know, I thought I knew everything right. And, <laughs> and, uh, I didn't always take the advice of my presidents, vice presidents, even my dad, you know, 20 something years later, I look back and that advice sinks in. Um, of course. but I, so I, so I, I came up there, I worked, um, settled in Chicago, had a number of jobs, uh, some jobs that, you know, looking back, they're all learning experiences. Some were toxic. Some I walked out of, um, and how old just, were you then when, when you walked out of those jobs, some of them? I was in my early to mid-20s. Right, um, right. You know, I, I had a job where they just literally weren't paying me <laughs> money. Yes. Um, it, they weren't paying me enough to begin with, but then they weren't. They stopped paying me for a few months. Wow. So I, I left. I, I had a job for a nonprofit. I walked out of that job. It was there was some toxicity there. Yeah. And I took a job. You know, you, you look back and, and, you know, our lives are a series of choices that we make. And some people are in denial about that. Yes. And they have this loss of sense of control that their current lot, their current situation and even their future is determined only by external forces. And that's mm. that's when you don't really have a sense of freedom. And 
So I took this job. I don't know why I took it. it well, I, I didn't have a job because I had walked out of my other job. Yes. And, but it was a, a massive pay cut. It was a small little job. I took it. I literally, so I was doing public relations and fundraising for a very, very small nonprofit. They literally had me working in a closet, like it was a storage closet with oh a desk. Huh. And so I was there for about eight months before I left. But it was a very special experience because that's where I met my wife. Oh, wow. And we started dating a little bit while we worked there, broke up. And just by happenstance, I moved to the city in Chicago. She moved to the city in Chicago, and we happened to move within two blocks of each other. <gasps> um, and kind of found that out, determined that. I had since moved on to a, a public relations firm. And, you know, shortly thereafter, we got engaged, and and the rest is history. But um, from there, I worked for a PR firm, and I had always wanted to work in politics. So I left the PR firm to work on a uh, fledgling U S Senate campaign that went nowhere, but I did such a good job that one of our consultants worked for a member of U S Congress. And so within 24 hours of us losing our race, he said, I want you to come and work for this member of U S Congress who's running for Senate. Hmm. So I thought I was actually moving to Iowa, back to Iowa to work on this U S Senate campaign, but they said, no, we want you in Washington, DC. So my wife and I got married and a week later, we came back. We went to France for our honeymoon, came back, and I moved directly to D. We moved right to Washington D.C. right after that. <laughs> wow! And and okay, so this. Why did they want you to become, you know, work for this for this senator? I mean, or congressman, or I, I don't know the right terminology, but sure. So how did that come about? I mean, what had you been doing? in your career up until that point, what was special about you being chosen for that? You know, it, it, it comes down to one word and that's hustle. Mm. And, you know, we had zero name ID. No one knew who my candidate was. And, you know, he had the promise of putting a lot of money into his campaign. He didn't end up and he didn't actually end up doing that, which is why we lost. Yes. <clears throat> um, because there were some other candidates who did, but, we, he actually bought a recreational vehicle and I sat in that recreational vehicle and traveled with him all over the state of Illinois to every little Hamlet, Berg, Ville, town, small town, big town. And I was on the phone 12 hours a day arranging radio interviews, newspaper interviews. Um, we would arrange press conferences everywhere we went. And gosh, I don't know, like over three months, there was something like a thousand interviews. And that was all me on the phone all day. I wouldn't take no for an answer. Mm. And so it ran me ragged. And so this 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 consultant from D.C. was like, wow, I've never seen that before. Mm. And he said, we, we want you to come aboard because you are, um, y you know, you're tenacious. Right. And so that's why they brought me over there. And and um so I went back and forth between D.C. and Iowa on that campaign. He ended up losing. It was a tier one race, uh, one of the biggest races in the country. He lost. Uh, and I went to work for a number of large trade associations in Washington, D.C. And after about five years of living in D.C., you know, my wife, I worked for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, you know, some other very large organizations. Yes. My wife was pregnant with our first child. You know, she wasn't in the political culture in DC. And if you're not a member of the political culture, it's, it's, it's an interesting place to live. Definitely. And so my father's health wasn't that great. So we decided to move back to Chicago. Right. And instead of, you know, I kind of bounced around of, all right, well, maybe I'll look at getting a job with a public relations firm or some sort of other association in Chicago. And I thought, you know what, my dream, I know what I want to do. I want to run my own business. I'm confident that I can do it. Yeah. And I went around, told three people and, or to three organizations that I had relationships with. And so I started my company. Uh, we moved back. I started it and um, had three clients right off the bat. Whoa. And that that's really, really interesting. I want to wind back just a little bit. And so you what what did you study at university? 
<laughs> I studied what a lot of people study when they don't know what they want to do with their life, which right. is political political science. Right. Um, you know, I I in high school I had a teacher who he and I probably differ politically in terms of political philosophy. Mm. Um, but he was, you know, when you look back at teachers who've had an impact on your life, his name yes. was Ed Noel, Ed Noel. And he would come in. He was the type of teacher who would stand on desks and yell and uh, in a good way and get you fired up. And and he got me so interested and excited about po- politics that I decided that's what I want to do. Mm. And so I went into political science, not knowing, all right, was I going to go to law school? You know, what was I going to do from then? And then when I was in uh, uh, college, I got involved in the public relation student society. And I was like, well, I'm going to study public relations because I'd like to be a press secretary because I'm, a, I like to write, I'm a good writer. Um, and so that's the way I'm going to go and kind of take that track. I minored in English and writing. Uh, I'm going to take that track to get to politics as a press secretary. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the educational path I took at the university. Right. Okay. So that explains then that your journey into doing something with politics was always something that you were interested in doing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But what, so what were the skills that you, you know, that you managed to get? I mean, obviously there was one job, you were only in that for a short time in the cupboard to meet your wife. That was the purpose of that one. (laughs) Right. But what was the purpose of the others? Do you think, you know, what, what did it, how did that prepare you then to get that confidence and start your own business? It, you know, my first, so there was a, a few things, you know, the first job that was where they weren't paying me, they actually had given me a lot of responsibility. And so we were doing events. Um, you know, there was, it was a husband and wife and me. And so they would send me to political fundraisers to meet some of these big politicians and, you know, put me in charge of. So so it was a great learning experience, even if I wasn't getting paid and I I had to eventually give it up. Then when I um, when I worked for a public relations firm uh, for about almost two years, uh, you know, that's when my wife and I got engaged when I was working there. And then I left for the political um, campaign. I had a mentor who owned and he passed away two, three weeks ago or about a, maybe about a month ago. And his name was name was Lou Williams and the public relations firm was L.C. Williams and Associates. And it, it's, it's interesting because it was downtown Chicago and a large portion of their clients were in the furniture industry. Um, and so they had like lazy boy furniture. They had a number of furniture. They had true value hardware. And so they, they had a lot of product public relations. Yes. My love, my love was really in public affairs issue advocacy, that type of thing. Yeah. And so it so happens that, uh, Lou, the head of the firm personally handled a number of, uh, energy clients. So the local natural gas energy utility, um, and then there was also a, uh, a, an electric utility uh, based in St. Louis that was having an issue. And so Lou took me under his wing and really kind of, you know, as a young account manager, let me run with it and run this account, which at a larger firm, I wouldn't have been able to do. Sure. And so I was out meeting, I was running town hall meetings with people in communities. I was running the research operation. I was dealing with the clients. And so <laughs> you know, I was already confident in myself. It probably inflated my ego more, but it gave me a lot of really good experience so that um, in my future work, I felt pretty supremely confident in my abilities. And, you know, it, 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 sometimes it, 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 it was a weakness, but, um, you know, I always felt confident that I was, you know, I didn't hesitate. I wasn't too deliberative. Sure. Uh, I'm an activator anyways. And so I would move forward. And then in hindsight, I look back and I'm like, wow, I really took a risk there. But I <laughs> I had been giving so much, you know, um, experience and so much responsibility at an early age that it, it fostered a sense of confidence. Well, and and there was somebody there that mm-hmm. trusted you, right? right. So right. they, they believed in you. And I think I think there's a massive compliment to you, but it's also a massive support for you to, 
you know, if someone believes in you and gives you the space to go and experiment, that is liberating for anybody in employment, right? And it, and it builds your confidence as a consequence. And I think, you know, that freedom to experiment is so important, but not just for in the workforce, not just for college, but I'm a big believer that there's a, a psychologist, Dr. Peter Gray, he has a book called Free to Learn. And he writes about the decline in unstructured play for kids. Mm. I mean, you know, from the time they're out of the womb, because, you know, when you come out of the womb, we have this sense of exploration of wonder at colors, at sounds, you know, even if it's just the back porch or exploring under the dining room table, right? Yes. And what there's been a, a sharp increase over the last, you know, many decades, I guess, of once you hit five years old, it's all about standardization. It's all about conformity. It's all about, I mean, you have people here in the States with, you know, uh, they're taking their kinder, their five-year-olds to interviews to get into the best kindergarten. Mm. And then they have to be well-rounded and it's all structured. And then once you get to, you, you, you get to be eight or nine years old, it's, well, you have to be well-rounded. And so you have to do this sport and that sport. Mm. And so everything is so structured. And Dr. Gray points to, you know, these kids are getting to 17, 18 years old, and there's been an increase over the last 50 years in not only depression, but this sense of helplessness and loss of control, mm. because over the course since these kids have been five, it's been so much structure and so much conformity and standardization that they've almost lost that freedom to even know how to experiment. Yeah. And so you have such a large portion, I think it's 50% of kids get to the part where they're going to go to university and they can't figure out a major. And then 80% changed their major more than once. Mm. There was a study, I think it was university of Pennsylvania or Penn state where this professor said she finds that most students are picking their major just because their dad told them to, or they felt pressured to do it. And so, you know, these people are getting to 40 or 50 years old and then they come to me as a coach and they're like, listen, I, I don't like what I've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. Well, um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. And, you know, <laughs> the other thing is they go through all of that, they end up in organizations where 85% of them are not engaged in the organization. You know, they don't want to be there anyway, but they're just being pushed in that direction. You know, yeah. there, is, um, there is a guy in India called Sadhguru. I don't know if you've come across him at all. And he's a he's like a mystic yogi and he has a school for kids and his school teaches sure English and maths and then creative studies, film, hmm. dance, music. That's what they allow the kids to express themselves and learn all of these creative studies. And it's it's a refreshing idea and it's working you know? And yeah. so, yeah, I, I really, really fascinating and interesting. You mentioned these studies and research and stat statistics. Um, okay. So thank you for that explanation in terms of, you know, how it gave you the building blocks and the confidence then to, to open your own business and get those three clients off the bat. I mean, that's pretty lucky, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it was, you know, it, it shows there's there's a lot of people I run into who are so afraid of taking that first step. Mm. And part of it is that, well, I don't know, what if I ask and they say no? You know, there, it's it's that fear of hearing the word no. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I merely just went out and I told, um, you know, uh, it was someone who was somewhat affiliated with a, a, the, where I worked. And I said, you know, I'm thinking of moving back to Chicago and starting my own business. Mm. And he looked at me and he said, I'll be your first client. <gasps> and it was that, it was that easy. And I think it, it, it's not going to be that easy for everyone. And I obviously had to do a good, good job once I got the client, sure. but there's so many people who don't realize that it could be easy if they just take that first step and just merely ask, you know, when I was in politics, they said the number one reason uh, someone doesn't vote for you is because you don't ask. And it was it was so interesting that all these candidates had such a problem at the end of ads, at the end of speeches, saying, my name is you know John Smith and I would be honored to have your vote. They would forget to say that or they they had a hard time saying that because yeah. there was this fear that someone would say no. <laughs> mm. That's it. Yeah. People may say no, but they may also say yes. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and you have to be confident in yourself 
And if you don't have that confidence, you know, when you own a business, that's when you're going to start cutting your prices, devaluing your business, because you're so afraid of hearing no that you just keep cutting your costs. Mm. And that's just a recipe for disaster. Okay, so so your new business in having moved back to Chicago, right? Right. Um, so what were you doing? Sure. So it was a public relations advertising agency. Right. Uh, and, you know, over the course of 13 years, it evolved. And I was doing a lot of kind of just traditional press and media relations at the beginning. Uh, but it morphed into more online work and everything from blogging and writing. And then once Facebook and Twitter came online, you know, we, we did more of that. Yeah. And then, it, and then it really became a lot of digital advertising, online video production, that sort of thing. Sure. And so it, 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 it really changed over the course of 13 years. And um, it was real interesting because it, it was an interesting time to have that firm because things were changing every day in terms of technology, in terms of social media, in terms of how you could communicate with people. Mm. And new things to learn, right, as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's still changing. It's, you know, you leave Facebook for six months, you come back and it's completely a completely new experience. Or LinkedIn, where you and I met. Yeah. I mean, LinkedIn of a year ago is, or even six months ago, is vastly different than LinkedIn of today. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So doing the PR, advertising, and so you still doing that? Uh, a little bit. I'm ramping it down. Right. Um, what, you know, after about um, six or seven years of my firm, my revenues were growing every year and we kept having kids. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to own my own business was to have freedom. And that's why a lot of people own their own business. They want that sense of freedom. Of course. However, when, when they build a business, and, and this was what I did. My revenues kept going up, but so did my sense of frustration and overwhelm. Yes. Where I was taking clients that were under paying, and that was my fault. Um, you know, you wanted to hit a certain revenue threshold, and so you take any client that came in the door. Mm -hmm. um, you started, you know, I was a very efficient worker. And so it, once I started my own business, I realized how much time I wasted when I worked at an office. And so I would get things, I'd be done with work and even my marketing and sales by like noon. And so I'd feel guilty. And so then I'd fill up another five hours, which just, I don't even know what busy work. Um, and so I became a very inefficient worker. I was taking clients I shouldn't have taken. I was doing things. I hadn't learned the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the basic fact of opportunity costs. And so there were things I wasn't good at, you know, spreadsheet management, bookkeeping, accounting, mm. all those things that a lot of folks will do and say, well, I'm going to save 500 bucks and I'm just going to do it myself. That's right. But if I pay someone, you know, 200 bucks or 500 bucks, I actually save two hours. And so that's a real opportunity cost. Not only that's two hours I can spend investing in clients that will help me mm. get to where I want to go, but it's also two hours I can spend with my wife, my kids. Mm. And so I really, I wanted to give it all up at that point. I didn't care about the revenue. I was, uh, my health was suffering. My wife was frustrated with me. I was frustrated with my clients. And so I turned it around and put together a program that um, helped me really scale my business. And there's, you know, there's a difference between growing a business and, and just scaling one. Yes. So. Yes. Which is <laughs> something you talk about, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So so did you, so you're winding the kind of PR and advertising down. Right. 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 As, as a result of all of this. And well, that, that came much later. So, right. so I put together this program. It started with the Gallup Strengths Finder program, which is about unlocking those naturally occurring patterns of thought, feeling and behavior, those things that get you out of bed in the morning, motivate you. Uh, they call them talents. And a lot of people confuse talents with skill. Yeah. Skill is like, I write well, I speak well. Talents are more ingrained. They're, you know, mine is learner, activator. And so when you turn those into strengths, um, you know, wh wh why, the reason that helped me was it's all about what's inside of me. And a lot of self-help programs and books I read were about trying to mimic a system or a process that worked for someone else. You know, oh, Richard Branson does 17 handstands in the morning. And if you do that, you too will be Richard Branson. You That's know, and right. I love Richard Branson. But so I used the Finder program and then I had a series of coaches and put together a program that worked for me. 
right. to really level up and scale my business. And about two or three uh, years ago, I started unofficially coaching others who were having the same problem as I did. And I realized that I really loved the coaching mm. and didn't so much love the PR and advertising anymore. And so about a year ago, I decided uh, a little over a year ago, you know what, I'm going to make this official and I'm going to do the full-time coaching and ramp down my public relations and ad firm. And so that's that's why I'm putting all my efforts into the coaching because it's it's my passion. Got you. Okay. Right. Wow. And But you applied the principles on yourself first, right? Right. So yes. you practiced on you before you are helping somebody else. And did it work for you? It did. I mean, and, and, and the reason I started coaching others is because they, they started seeing me. Mm -hmm. You know, I would post pictures of being out on a kayak at, you know, two in the afternoon. How mm -hmm. do you do that and work? I, I do because there's a lot of people who use the term and I, I, I can't stand the term. I think it's BS mm -hmm. work life balance. I know. And, you know, the, the, the problem with that is people think that there's going to be, you know, you think of a seesaw or a teeter tot or whatever you want to call it. And the problem is a lot of people say, well, 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 two things. One is there's not work over here and life over here. There's just life. That's right. And there's three facets of life. There's work, family, and self. And the key is aligning those three in a way that works for you. And, you know, work-life balance, when people say that, a lot of times they're like, well, I'm just going to put a lot of weight on the work portion of the seesaw you know, for 20 years until I'm 65, because that's what you have to do. That's what my father did. That's what my grandfather did. And when you get to 65, then I'll spend time with family. Well, I can't tell you the number of people I know or people who have known people who get to 65, they retire, have a heart attack, get mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. um, also, by the time you get to 65, your kids are 25. You missed, you know, that, that, that first tooth coming out. You missed them driving. You missed, you missed all that time. And so a lot of people give up the prime of their life because they feel like they have to put so much into the work and then it'll all balance itself out from 65 to 85, you know, when they put it into life. But um, it just doesn't work that way. And not only that, you might be dead by the time you get to 65. Exactly. Right. No, and, it, it, that's exactly right. And, you know, th this is a really important point you're making because, you know, this podcast is aimed at people no, some that might already be in business and perhaps motivate them to, you know, get up and go a bit further than where they are today, but also about people that are stuck in jobs and, you know, they are just not enjoying it and they want to get out and do something else, but they haven't got the courage. Well, this, what you're talking about here is, okay, go and set up your own business, but go into it with your eyes open and that you create something that you can you can also enjoy life in the process <laughs> because you know as well as i do it is tough setting up your own business it's hard work running your whether you're running a pr advertising agency or a coaching business you know there are pressures on that you put on yourself that no one else can so how do we do it kurt <laughs> Well, you know, one, and I actually have a video that I'm posting later today because someone asked me, um, you know, what's the single greatest lesson you learned over your career? And there's, you know, there's a number of them. But earlier in the interview, I said, you know, coming out of college, I was so supremely confident in myself. And I, you know, I didn't always listen to the advice or actively listen to the advice at the time and let it soak in of my VPs, my presidents, even my dad, who was, who was my biggest mentor. And the, the single greatest lesson I've learned is that I don't know everything. And it took some failures, some setbacks, some humbling experiences for me to really, and, and it's still a process, to throw dogma out the window and to really start taking the blinders off, learning from my daily experiences, learning from the people I meet, the people I, I, I speak to. You know, it took me a long time you know, when I wanted till I wanted to give it up till I reached out to a coach, because at that point, and, and I see this from a lot of people, they're afraid of that. They, they're afraid of opening up, being vulnerable, realizing they need help. Mm. 
And so some people ask me as a coach, you know, who's your biggest competitor? Is it other coaches? And it's not. It's the potential clients themselves who are afraid of being vulnerable, who are afraid of saying, I need help. Some of them are fearful of that they're going to open up a can of worms, right? Yes. And, and so it's easier to be in denial and in a comfort zone than to open it up and, and reveal your scars. And, uh, oh, my gosh, now I have to do some work to make change. Um, and so learning that, the fact that I don't know anything to reach out to, to, to reach out to some mentors was, was really the biggest. Um, and I do that. So, I mean, on a daily basis, now I have a support network of probably about eight people, uh, and they reach out to me too. And it, and it just makes it, you know, as, as a small business owner, there's nothing worse than feeling that you're alone on an Island. Yes. And that's, it, it can not only cause frustration and anxiety, it can also, um, uh, you know, really give you this sense of, um, uh, it's dangerous to do because there's not a check on your bad ideas. <laughs> yes. Um, which is one reason even Bill Gates, he has a, a Ted talk about, you know, everybody needs a coach. And in that talk, he talk, he, he mentions the fact that, you know, every CEO, they're the smartest people in the room. They need to check on their ideas, even if they're so, because you can be so confident in your ideas that when you're marching down a path that is sure to go to destruction, having someone say, you know, he might want to take another look at that it can be really helpful in protecting you from yourself. Mm. And, and I'm going to counter that a little bit because you also know that if you don't go down that journey and make some of those mistakes, that's right. where sometimes some of the biggest learning takes place. Right. Um, however, the smarter way would be, as you said, if you want to do a shortcut, then get a coach because a coach can, at least you have somebody that will provide you some counsel and ask the right questions right. for you to then re-examine those great ideas. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about it. Let me go away and think about that now. Um and that's often, I think it's where the power is, is in the coach asking those challenging questions that you are sometimes too shy, too afraid to ask yourself. That is exactly the case. And, you know, like you said, I mean, there, there, there's been mentors and members of my support group who've given me advice and, and, and it made me think and stop a little bit. And sometimes it stops, makes me think, and those questions make me think. And I'm like, no, no, I think I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I move forward. But there's there's enough times too where I think about it and no, that you know what, they're right. I need to rework my pricing. I need to work rework my structure. I need to um, and so you, ha you have to be confident enough to move forward when you're sure of yourself. But again, as a coach, you know, and you hit the nail on the head, the number one thing I do is actively listen, mm. but then I ask questions. Yeah. I never tell someone what to do. And if they have an idea, I never say that's a bad idea, but I ask enough questions where sometimes they come to the realization, maybe I ought to rethink that. Mm. Um, or maybe by asking questions, it reinforces in their mind that their idea is a good one. Yeah. You know, it can work both ways. Mm. And the trouble is we're so the world is on autopilot. So all of our brains are have got automatic programs. You do stuff in your life and you don't even remember that you did that stuff. Right. And so, you know, you could ask people, did you brush your teeth this morning? And you go, oh, I don't remember how I did it, but I remember doing it. <laughs> um, well, can you explain exactly what you did? No, I can't because you're on autopilot. And Life and work happens in that way too, I believe. And by, you know, in what you do, I think you're stopping people from just putting the autopilot on pause <laughs> for a right. minute or two right. and kind of go, hold on a minute, why I'm back and just review where you just came from and the journey you took and where's the journey going and have a look at the map and is the map clear enough? And it's so important. And I use 
you know, I don't use a coach, but I use many other teachers that sure. I listen to, that I read about, that allows me to put some of those things into practice. But yeah, I, I still agree with you. It's vitally important. So, so this is still quite young for you as well, the, the coaching side, or how long have you been doing this? Well, I've been unofficially doing it for about three years. Right. And, um, you know, I decided last year I went and got, because Gallup, the, the Strengths Finder program was such a big part, I decided, listen, I'm going to make this official. I'm going to go get certified. <clears throat> and so I went through about 40 hours of coaching and testing and, um, and certification process, got certified by Gallup. And, and are so, these the same yeah. people that do all the kind of research and surveys and things, Gallup? Ex exactly. Right. But they have they have a large section of what they do that is focused on the strengths based psychology and strengths based development. Wow. Which which looks at um, what if instead of you know the, the the popular development model in society is deficit based. Look at your weaknesses and focus on those to try to fix them. Mm. You know, you look at the majority of parents Gallup finds. In the, country, in the United States says that um, students should mostly focus, even to the detriment of other subjects that they're good in, should mostly focus on the subjects they're bad in, which I say is like telling Usain Bolt, you know what, we're going to have you really focus on the mile. <laughs> your 100 meter is great, but your mile time sucks. So you're not allowed to run the 100 anymore. You're going to focus on the mile, you know, mm. or Mozart. Well, you're really good at the piano, but your tuba playing stinks. <laughs> so we're going to have you focus on that. Um, and that goes to the, you know, exploring your exploring the excitement, like like we said before. Um, but but it's also they have a large along with that strength based development focused on workplace and employee engagement. Yes. And they do studies every year and big reports. And they've been doing this for about 40 years in terms of looking at what makes an engaged workforce, what makes a team that is fully engaged. And so it's really fascinating. And so my coaching program starts with strengths to find out what those internal things are that are really that move you, those those patterns of thought, feeling and behavior. And when you intentionally use those every day and combine them with your knowledge and your skills and work them out like you would a muscle, that's when you turn them into strengths. And so you can use those strengths to find, listen, if, if you want to make a career or a lifestyle change, what role is going to be right for you where you work in your strengths zone? Yes. But then you can also use your strengths. You know, we put together a performance plan with smart goals. You can use those strengths as tools, as weapons to hammer away every day at those smart goals. So it starts with strengths. And then we take you through vision, values, your challenges and opportunities, your smart goals, all the way to your objective, which has to be well-defined. And I always challenge every single person I meet that your objective should be so big and audacious that it makes you squirm, <laughs> it makes you uncomfortable. And and so is this done like a questionnaire based to begin with or interviews or how is this done? Yeah, so it starts with uh, there's a, an assessment that anyone can actually take online. It's at strengthsfinder.com. You take the assessment, it takes you about 45 minutes. Right. Uh, you, you can unlock every human has 34 talent themes. And so they're, like I said, learner, activator, achiever, deliberator, responsibility. And they really tell a lot about your internal behaviors and what moves you, what motivates you, what, what you're like to interact with. And so um, you take that assessment. Um, it's the beginning of my coaching program and we really look at it. Some people take it and they put it aside and, you know, Gallup provides a number of helpful things like the strengths finder 2.0 book. They provide some testimonials, but sometimes you need some context in each of them because I have clients who get on the first call and they're like, well, I'm not that, that talent theme doesn't apply to me. And after five minutes, they're like, Oh my gosh, that's totally me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it starts with that assessment. And then my coaching program is, regular video calls, uh, right. 60, 60 to 90 minute calls, depending on their coaching program, sometimes every week, sometimes three times a month. So you take the report that somebody's completed and you work through it? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, how relevant would this be for somebody who was looking to start up their own business, for example? It's relevant for any objective that you want to hit. I've actually used it to help people with their fitness goals. I've used it with uh, homeschooling parents, you know, in terms of organizing their household. Um, my wife and I use it to help each other interact. It's great with teams because, 
you know, if someone's a deliberator and you're an activator, if you don't appreciate that, you might think that person never gets off the dime. And that person might think, wow, you're so impatient and sloppy. But if you have an appreciation for each other's talents, you can become a super team. Wow, the deliberator tempers the activator and vice versa. <laughs> so for someone, um, it was invaluable for me. And it took, you know, six or seven years to get there before I did this because I realized that explains that behavior. That's why I hate doing that. Yes. You know, and that is a, you know, you look at it of really focus on amplifying your strengths. Don't ignore your weaknesses, but manage them. Put processes in place to delegate, to outsource, um, to figure out how to get that done, to bring in strategic allies who can do those things better. And it's not just a matter of your skill or what you'd like to do. It's just a matter of if I'm that takes me two hours to do because it's not my strength zone. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I'm an activator. So so activator is one of my top five strengths. Mm -hmm. And so I'm impatient. Many times a lot of people say I'm fire ready aim. <laughs> it's yes. kind of ready aim fire. <laughs> and so it always helps me. I learned that's where my my mentors have come in, my support network and my coach to say, I'm about to launch this missile. Should I? You know, and like you said, just asking those questions allows me to stop. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'm going to hit the fire button. Or sometimes it's, you know what, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. Um, and, and so, yeah. <laughs> it sounds brilliant because, wow, I wish I had something like that before I started my business, you know, to to see where, what I would be suited to, what I would be good at, and what I've got to outsource. Because you're right, as a single you know, business owner, you start off doing everything yourself. And of right. course, you're not good at everything at all. And I made mistakes, big mistakes in that journey. So getting that getting that knowledge right up front, right at the beginning, even when you have the idea that goes, right, I'm going to start that because I think there's a gap here somewhere. Let's resign and jump in, <laughs> start my business. Right. Um, so it would be, yeah, learn about yourself, where your strengths are, then decide what you're going to do. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I'm working with a client right now who has worked in a government IT job, in, in, you know, or the industry for 31 years, and he wants to get out. And, mm. you know, some of his talent themes that we found are like individualization, uh, restorative, which likes to help other people build them up. Uh, individualization is kind of like individual coaching one on one. He has relator, which is, you know, likes really tight knit groups of people and to interact with them. And he looked at that and said, that's not me. Mm. I'm so shy. You know, I'm an introvert. I can never do that. Well, what we figured out is no, you're really not. It's just that because maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was someone else, uh, repressed it for 31 years. And so to see him start to exercise those talents he's like a networking machine and he can't stop. And it just gives him joy and happiness to go out and interact with people. He's 54 years old and he thought that wasn't me. And it really was. Oh my and God. So it, it, it's really, you know, watching someone blossom. Cause I have a lot of people who come to me, they're in their fifties, even their sixties. And they say, I'm 55 years old and I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. That's and in right. many cases it's because they've, they've repressed things um, be for whatever reason for so long. And so I, I tell them, it doesn't matter if you're 25 or 65, if you have one more day, one more hour to live on this earth, why would you want to spend that time without finding out what you're good at, what you love to do without a sense of passion or fulfillment? Mm. That That's invaluable. I think having that knowledge and it's, I, I believe there isn't enough done you know, we talked about kind of schools and what they teach and not enjoying it and all of that at the beginning. But self-awareness is having that sense of knowledge about yourself. That's the liberating. Yeah, you, you're lucky if you find somebody who can see that in you and support you and sees your strengths and allows you to experiment and trust you. But not everybody gets that luxury. So therefore, you have got to know yourself the best and get that knowledge about who you are, first of all. 
Absolutely. And, and Michael, earlier you mentioned about, you know, one of the most invaluable things a mentor or someone can do is, is ask those questions. Yes. And so that self-awareness portion is so important. And we start with it. And I've had some people say no to my coaching program because they're like, well, can't we just skip that? Can't we just skip that and get to the nitty gritty? Yes. And they want like the, all the, the answers. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Just give and me I the have, answers. <laughs> and pe- you know, people come in and they're like, well, I'm, I'm really self-aware. I'm so self-aware. And after our first session, I had someone last week say, wow, I'm tired. This is really tiring. He's like, I thought I was self-aware, but this is a workout. And they were, they were not, they were questions that if someone heard me asking you, they'd be like, oh, those are easy questions. But then when I turn to them and ask them the questions, they're like, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> and and it, it happens all the time where they come out of that self-awareness session saying, wow, I guess I wasn't as self-aware as I thought I was. Yes. So, wow. Okay, so where where's the journey from here? You've been doing this for three years. You're you're winding down the PR and advertising a little bit. You're moving, ramping the coaching side up. What's the plan, and and how is this going to to grow and expand and and be enjoyable for you? Sure. Well, the the coaching business has exploded since November. Right. And uh, a lot of it is due in part to LinkedIn. As you mentioned, I do videos on LinkedIn just about every day. Um, and so people are, are it, the messages I get every single day, not only from people who end up being clients and coached, but people, I had a young woman in Nigeria. She emailed me or she messaged me through LinkedIn and said, you inspire me every day. And then went on to tell me the story. She grew up in a polygamy family of 18 kids that had two wives mm. and she, she fought through all that to be the first in her family to graduate from university. And now she started an agricultural NGO helping farmers in her country. Wow. And so she tells me I inspire her. And so if I can touch people in that way and motivate them in that way, even if they, even if I don't coach them, even if they're never a client, um, that to me fulfills my mission. And my mission is saving the world. Even if it's just one person, one kid, one client, <laughs> my wife, you know, one person at a time. Yes. And so I really focus on that mission rather than I got to get X amount of clients today. Yes. And in doing so, it's helped me really build my business very quickly. Uh, you know, I've coached 10 people over the last two and a half months. Uh, and I have people coming into my coaching program all the time. Uh, and so I have personalized coaching. I'm going to grow into, uh, I want to grow and I have had people contact me about public speaking. Yes. Uh, and then doing team facilitations where I go into corporations and or companies and and we do the strengths finder with their team to help them interact and gel better as a team. Mm. So it's really exciting. It's really fulfilling. Sometimes I almost get overwhelmed emotionally from the messages that I get from people because I started this out as, well, I'm just going to share my thoughts online. And it's really turned into people from all over the world messaging me with their stories, their challenges, their um, and, and sometimes I just go to my wife and I'm in tears that, you know, uh, I don't know how I can help this person because they're in Africa, they're in India and they're in just they're in such grinding poverty. Um, yet they're still fighting every single day. And, it, and it's really moving. Mm. Brilliant. Oh, I love it. <laughs> this is fantastic. And I I know we're running out of time because you have another meeting to go to. So please share with the audience, uh, Kurt, where, where can they find you? You've mentioned LinkedIn. Where else can they find you, connect with you, learn, watch your videos, get inspired and try it out? Sure. So I'm super active on LinkedIn. I've I've just becoming more active on Instagram. I'm on Twitter uh, for what that's worth. Yes. And Facebook. I've uh, Facebook. I have a private Facebook group, but the uh, it's all my name, my full name, which is pretty long, which is Kurt Mercadante, which I know you'll said you'll have in the show notes. Yes. But uh, whether it's LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, or even Facebook, it's just my full name all the way through Kurt with a C. And so, you, and you uh, have a website. Yeah. I do. Uh, go to KurtMercadante.com. Nice and easy. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> and and is that is that the name of your company? No, the name of my company is actually Gravina Coaching Systems. And Gravina is the name of the town in Italy where my grandfather was born, my father's father. And so when my father passed away, I started naming my, my, my companies uh, Gravina in his honor. 
Wow, you missed that <laughs> bit in the story. <laughs> so I'm glad I got it out of you at the end. <laughs> oh my yeah. God, brilliant. Yeah, oh, we have fascinating backgrounds, don't we? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone's got a story. And, and that's one reason I love coaching is because my number one talent theme is learner. And I just love sitting and listening to people's stories. Same here. Same here. And thank you so much for sharing yours with us today. Hugely inspirational. You're doing a fantastic job for everybody out there. Anybody wanting to get into business on their own, go and speak to Kurt first before you do anything <laughs> um, because you've got a tool that is invaluable. So well done. Excellent work. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And next time you're over in the UK, please sh give a shout out and we'll have a coffee uh, and some lunch uh, or whatever. And um, thanks again, Kurt. And I, I hope to see your videos later on today and in the coming weeks as well. I'm really enjoying them too. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. Take care and all the best. Bye for now. Thanks. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.